Hello and welcome all into the MO Podcast. You're here with me, Consummation Sand, and my lovely co-host, Atreya. And today we are going to be talking about the Dyatlov Pass incident. So this was an incident that happened in 1959, and the bare basics of it are pretty straightforward, but if you start digging a bit deeper, it gets a little bit... Mulder and Scully. Indeed. Nine people died in a skiing expedition in Russia. There was ten people in total on the on this expedition. And the one that survived was Yuri Yudin. Super hot. Yeah. (laughs) And the reason that he survived was he had knee and joint pain and he had to drop out after the first day. In fairness, I, I don't even know why they took him because... He had rheumatism. I don't know why he went either. How far did he think he was going to get? I, 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 this, this is this is weird, and it makes it even more weird that he was like level two. I know they were all certified. So he had rheumatism and a congenital heart problem even before this all started. And when he was on the the hike, the, the expedition, he started suffering from knee and joint pain and, and couldn't go on. He'd slow the group down. So they basically sent him back and he's the only survivor in fairness i think cat would have got further than uh, he did and and that's actually saying something yeah but cat's a viking i know she'd have, she'd have made it there and yeah. back he's supposed to be uh hardcore russian i mean i can tell why he looks intense now in them pictures it's probably because he's in pain <laughs> oh, bloody hell i don't know i kind of took it that he was off his tits on like pain relief good was that kind of it was a blue steel Kind of look. Could be, could be as well. Yeah, I've seen Cat when she's been on pain relief. <laughs> Poor Cat, she takes some flack off you. Trust me, she gives it out. <laughs> Good, you deserve it. <laughs> so, of the group, of the ten of the group, nine were aged between twenty to, to twenty-four year olds, and there was a thirty-eight year old Semyon Zolotarov. And I, I'm, I'm guessing he only did it for one thing, to try and relive his youth, because uh, he's, he's, he's really the odd one out in this one. He played the mandolin as well, didn't he? As well as one of the other members. He would keep them all cheery, playing his mandolin. Mm. He was a war veteran mm. as well, and uh, a physical edu- a sports educator. PE teacher. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds better the way you said it. Yeah, I've not been to school or done any PE for many, many years. <laughs> yeah, so all these, these, all ten of them were, I'm not going to say professional, but they were very, very experienced in what they were doing. They were level two in hiking, and they would have got their, gone on if they would have made this uh, this climb, this, this expedition. They would have got their level three, which, just to put it into perspective, they were very accomplished with climbing peaks between 2,000 and 6,000 metres with rock, ice and snow. They knew what they were doing. The route had been verified and accepted by the Solovsky City Committee of Physical Culture and, and Sport. It wasn't just, they just decided one day, let's go on Saturday, let's go for a wander. This was, this was an organised thing that they'd have to get people to sign off on just to get their certification and to be able to do it. And you had to be pretty good at it to have the honour of being on an expedition with Igor Dyatlov as well, because he was like the best of the best. Yeah, indeed. And it was the USSR. It wasn't Russia. This was like you had to go, you had to follow all the bureaucracy. You had to tick all the boxes to be able to get a loaf of bread, never mind going to wander for 200 miles in in the goddamn snowy mountains. Yeah, you have to be a raging commie. Yeah, most were, but yeah, it was ba- it was just shy. It was 190 miles, just shy of 200 miles. This route, and it should have taken roughly about two weeks. They set off on the 29th of January, and they were supposed to be back, or at least sent word that they were back by the 12th of February. So, for them, I don't think they saw this as much of a hardship. That it was just another out in in the snow kind of thing yeah but 12th of february came and went and they no one had heard at the university no one had heard anything and they weren't that bothered because even when yuri udin was leaving the atlov said well it could be a bit iffy 
on the 12th because the weather and and how we're doing already yeah he told um yuri yudin that they put they'd most likely be about three days late and yudin was supposed to actually let the university know but he went home like on his jollies for like in new year and just totally forgot <laughs> to tell anyone that oh by the way they might be three days late as you do yeah yeah it's that blue steel that's what he was concentrating on rather than uh <laughs> Oh, it was worth it. Swimming. Well, I, 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 seriously, just have a look at the pictures and just <laughs> let, let me know at least if you think he's, he's... He's a handsome guy. I'm not saying he's not handsome, but I mean the way he's you... He's like a Twilight extra. The way you go on about him, he's like goddamn Brad Pitt. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's got nice features. It's better looking than Brad Pitt, actually. Each to their own. They say beauty is in the eye of the beer holder. Uh, <laughs> bee holder, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah. Beer yeah. holder. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He's a six pint uh, <laughs> for me, anyway. <laughs> well, good. More for me. <laughs> hey, I'm not going out drinking with you ever. Because well, I'll steal all the good men from Shit, you. Shit, that came out wrong, did it? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I probably will. <laughs> Let's skirt over that. That's That'll be heavily edited. <laughs> so, anyway. The, uh, oh. The 12th of February came and went, no one had heard anything, and no one was really that bothered. They gave him a few days, still nothing had been heard of. And then the 12th of February, the actual families of these people went to the university. They went to the authorities and said, look, we need to know where they are. They're not back now. A few days is fine, but it's been like, over a week. And the first group that they set out, set the search party, the first group, and the ones that actually found the bodies were teachers and volunteer students. They weren't police or military. They got involved a little bit later on. They found the tent was near a clearing, but it was on the side of the mountain. It wasn't in the tree line. It wasn't under trees, which is if, if, you're a hiker and certainly if you've got these people's experiences just in case of anything happening you you wouldn't want to be out in the open so one of the reasons is that you didn't actually said was maybe the atlov didn't want to lose the the altitude they've got because they climbed up quite high yeah it wasn't really that far to get to the tree line. So it's still a bit confusing as to why. Maybe, again, maybe Yuri again said, maybe he was speculating that they were practicing being out in the open and having a tent and having a camp on the, on the mountainside. The tent was flattened, covered in snow. There was belongings that had been left behind and the tent had actually been cut from the inside. So it, it hadn't been opened yeah. in the normal way. Someone had actually cut themselves out of the tent. And there was nine sets of footprints around the area that were people just wearing socks or in their bare feet. Looking at that, it looks like people have woke up in the middle of the night or something startled them. They've had to rush to get out and they don't have time to change. For me, that sends warning signs to me because... That, they had time to do other stuff, but not put clothes on. Experienced hikers that know it's minus 20 degrees outside and they think, we'll not bother with our shoes, we'll be fine. I just, that, I don't buy it. <laughs> I know, it's, 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 a re it's a really bizarre situation they found themselves in. I mean, so near the tent and spaced at least 300 metres apart, I think the first... One was spaced 300 metres and then it ran up to 500 metres. Yura Doroshenko and Yuri Kirovnyshenko were found next to each other, just in their underpants. Maybe we'll note here that Yuri actually bit his knuckle off. Yeah. Don't know why or how. Maybe he was falling asleep and he was trying to wake himself up. Like keep himself awake because it's like inst instead of falling asleep and succumbing to the cold. Could be. Or maybe he's... Maybe he got a bit peckish. Yeah, or just like scared, witless. Stifling a scream. Yeah. yeah. Near to him was Iger Dyatlov, who was the uh, the leader of the pack. He was he was dressed, but he, he didn't have any shoes on. Zin Adia Kolomoa Grover seemed like she was scrambling back to the tent, but she had a red bruise on her torso 
which mm. some people said looked like it was made by a baton. Yeah, some kind of blunt instrument. Yeah, something long and thin and heavy. And then Rustam Solobonin, Solobodnin had a fractured skull. Now, he had two pairs of trousers on, four pairs of socks and one boot. That's preparation for you. Yeah, I mean, we all get dressed in the dark every now and then, but <laughs> it's just it's a bit of overkill there, really. Uh, I mean, why have two pairs of trousers if you're only going to put one boot on? What's yeah. Thinking? I mean, it's worth mentioning as well that um, Kolmogorova, Dyatlov, and both the Yuris were found on February 27th, but Slobodin wasn't actually found until March the 5th, so it was quite some time after that he was actually found. I mean, he may have survived a few more days and nicked some clothes off the others, or maybe he was just harder to find. Could be. I mean, that is a theory uh, uh, that we'll probably discuss later, Yeah, but it is something that has been speculated on. Yeah. And then in May, which is over two months later, the other four were actually found. Yeah. They were found under four metres of snow and 75 metres away from the camp. Nikolai Tebu. Tibalt Brignoles. Brignoles, there you go. <laughs> he had a fractured skull. Alexander Polovatov, he had a wound behind his ear and his neck was twisted in a, in a very strange way. And he also had missing eyebrows. <laughs> that's that's what you've picked up from this, haven't you? This just really irritates you. This just bothers you, doesn't it? I just want, I want to know where they are. Where are they? <laughs> Maybe he didn't have any to start. Maybe he shaved them off as a joke. Yeah, but I'm sure, I'm sure they would have known. Yeah, I'm sure someone would have said. Why is it such a fact in the case? He's got missing eyebrows. If 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 someone would have just gone, no, he's got alopecia. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's never had any. <laughs> Who knows? So, and there was uh, Ludmilla Dubin Ina. She had multiple broken lip, ribs, no eyes, no tongue, and part of her lip was gone. She was wearing Yuri's clothes, who the guy who bit off his knuckle, she was wearing his clothes. So maybe that as well, again, with Rustin, with what you were saying, maybe she was alive a little bit longer than them two, and then they'd gone back and taken the clothes. Yeah. And then the last one, the older gentleman, uh, Semyon Zolotaryov, he had multiple broken ribs and no eyes. Of the nine, six died of hypothermia, two of them died of chest trauma, and Nikolai, who had the fractured skull, died from his skull injury. Yeah. At the time, in 1959, they were, after the post-mortem and the, the, the cause of death was a compelling natural force. Uh, it was hypothermia, chest trauma, skull injury, but a compelling natural force had happened and forced these people's hand into making the decisions they made. It's interesting to note that it was reopened, this case, in 2019, and the actual official cause that they gave, yeah. which was rendered in 2020, just this year, was death by avalanche. No. <laughs> now, that's the that's the official cause. They When the case was reopened, the Russian authorities said they weren't looking into a crime. They were going on the compelling nat natural force, which was either a avalanche, a hurricane, something naturally occurring. It wasn't they've completely ruled out anything untoward happening to these people. And the best they could come up with was avalanche. Which just doesn't fit. No, a lot of things don't fit here. I mean, what what are your theories on this? Well, for me, it's worth noting that the crews that were sent in to recover the bodies, the helicopter pilots actually flat out refused to take the bodies away without them being in zinc-lined coffins because they were frightened of toxic or biological leakage. This is all being taken from a book by Donny Icar called Dead Mountain, The Untold True Story of the Dyatlov Pass Incident, which I have absolutely binged in the last day and a half because it's amazing. So these helicopter pilots already thought something was amiss. No, no, I'm not having these bodies in my helicopter without them being in zinc-lined coffins because they might have radiation leakage, they might be... They might have, uh, we just don't know what's happened to them. So no, I'm not taking them. 
So straight away for me, why would you, why would that be an instant thought? If you were just some helicopter recovery guy that was taking the bodies away to the coroner, to the morgue, to have their autopsies, my first thought would not be, oh hell no, a tarpaulin bag is not going to do it. I want a zinc lined coffin. I'd just be like, load them up. Come on, let's get them out of here. Why, why did he straight away want, I don't get it. Yeah. I mean, for me as well, that is a, this is, I, I'm going to assume uh, that he's part of either the police or the military, mm-hmm. the helicopter pilot, and they only got involved after the fact of these bodies being discovered in the way they were. So that, for me, is red flags there everywhere. Yeah, definitely. Also, the the fact that they left the tent, clearly, without any shoes, is just it's just bonkers to me, with them all being as experienced as they were. Whatever made them leave that tent in a hurry, enough to destroy their tent, a perfectly good tent, cut it from the inside, rendering it useless, but leave all their stuff, their, their food, their supplies, everything, just basically do a Mary Celeste and just up and leave instantly and then forget their shoes. They knew, surely, they wouldn't last five minutes out in that snow without even basic foot protection, footwear or anything. They would die. They, surely they would know that. So what made them just up and leave and forget to put their shoes on? Because they, they would either die in the tent. Say it was an avalanche, they either die in the tent, crushed under an avalanche, or they hurry the hell out of there and they die outside of hypothermia. It's six and two threes. It's either choose how you want to die or there's something more to it. That That's the thing as well. And with the avalanche theory that they would try to say, there is pros and cons for it. Obviously, they, the bodies were found under four metres of snow after the snow melts. So obviously, yeah, you think... Okay, they weren't on the surface. There must have been something to cause that four metres of snow. Yeah. But the first rescue party that were there said there's no broken trees, no debris, no evidence of an avalanche. There's been a 100 expeditions in this area since then, and not one has reported conditions to cause an avalanche, never mind seeing an avalanche. Yeah. And the footprints were people of walking. They weren't in a blind panic. Mm -hmm. They were walking. They could tell from the, the, the spread pattern of the feet that these were not panicked people who thought, my life's in immediate danger. I need to get out of here. Yeah. So why, why at least take a little minute or two to put shoes on of all things? And grab some basic food. (laughs) Yeah. You're going to need, you're going to need your feet. If you're in, four metres of snow, or however much snow you're in, you're going to need your feet to get out of there. Surely that's... Exactly. If they're they're experienced hikers, they've been using their feet doing this forever. Yeah. Surely they know that is their most important tool to get out of this situation. Even if they don't have a tent, even if they don't have rations with them, the thing that they need to cover up... Exactly. ...is their feet. Because once you get frostburn or high, like frostburn on your feet, you can't walk. So you're going to crawl out of there? Exactly. And if there had been an avalanche, everything in their tent was perfectly like... It, it, nothing was disturbed. Nothing was tipped over. Nothing was blown away. Everything was totally fine. Also, I know that... Um, okay, so Dubininia... Uh, Zolotaryov, Kolevatov, and Tibor Brynjol, the ones that were found at the bottom of the ravine, I I think that clearly they died because they fell into a 24-foot ravine. Their their injuries seem to be corresponding with the fact that they've had a a nasty fall. But uh, Zena, she she was the one that had the, the blunt force bruise. Now, she wasn't anywhere near the ravine. She wasn't near anything other than snow, and that is strange to me how she has received this injury when she's not near anything that can cause it. Yeah, she's just in the in the in the middle of between the tree line and the 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 campsite. Yeah. There's nothing there that would indicate anything falling on her. Yeah. It kind of had to be made by something striking her. Yeah. Which is exactly what I think. I know there's like the theories about Dubininia and how she she had 
she was missing her eyes and her tongue and you know she somebody cut her tongue out but i i genuinely think that was probably animal predation she was there for a while um her body was really badly decomposed when they removed it i i do genuinely think that animals just kind of did that work i don't necessarily think she was tortured or anything like that but it is Zena that that has the issue for me just because of that bruise and the fact that it looked like she was heading back towards the tent as well. Whereas the others that were wearing more clothes from the other hikers seemed to be moving further away from the tent. Why would you go back, collect your teammates' clothes who have died of hypothermia, put them on, and then move further away from your only form of heat? protection, supplies, everything. Why were they moving further away? Yeah. No sense. <laughs> Maybe it makes sense if it was me or you, but the, these guys knew exactly what they were doing. They knew where they were going. They knew how long it was going to take. They knew what they were going to come across during this expedition. Yeah. There's nothing really that should have put this panic into them. No, exactly. I mean, even if they'd made for their, they had a, like a, a storage cache further away. Yeah. It, even if they started making their way towards that, but they didn't. It's like they tried to make a fire. Uh, clearly, the the two of them tried to make a fire. Their hands and and skin were actually found burned, as if they'd just kind of gone. I am so cold. I can't get heat from this fire, and just put their limbs in the flame. But. They had this tiny little fire and they collected wood to keep it going, which they failed to do. But they were right next to a group of trees. Set the trees alight. <laughs> yeah. You know, set them alight and make a big fire that'll burn for hours. They didn't they didn't think to do that, even though they did they were found to have matches sewn into their clothes. So they could have started a fire, set one of the trees alight and, and that would have worked. But they didn't. It's like they all kind of were just in this state of confusion. Yeah. Like, you know, some of them had like one sock on and no sock on the other foot. And it just, I mean, their clothes also had radiation. When it was measured in in the 1950s, uh, they'd said, oh, the radiation level is abnormal and, and they had high amounts of radiation in their clothes. But when it's been reevaluated, um, but recently, it's found actually wasn't abnormal for that time or for that area at all. So I think we can probably rule out radiation. Standard for Russia, in it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the why expend energy on trying to start a fire where you are rather than just use your energy to go back and get clothes? Yeah, exactly. Even if it is uphill, obviously, I may be thinking about this just outside of a skier, a mountaineering person's brain. But for me, rather than break off branches, the amount it would have took to try and start a fire, because obviously wet wood doesn't light, cold wood takes time to try, to try and expend all your energy doing that. Why not use your energy to go back and get clothes? You're not really that far away. Yeah. And then once you're there, you had a camp already yeah exactly they had sleeping bags you could have gotten a sleeping bag well two sleeping bags whatever just put all your clothes on just try and get warm and then get your energy back i think for me it just seems like there's there's a lot of confusion going on with these people they're too experienced to be making these kind of rookie mistakes yeah well you know um diatlov's younger sister said she was quoted as saying the snow didn't kill him. She was convinced that that's not what happened. Um, she said his skin was orange and his hair was white. And she said that, uh, and I've, I've seen the, the pictures of, of Dyatlov's body and he, he, he's, he's, I mean, I, I could recognize him from the picture. He was fairly recognizable. But she said that their family could only recognize him because of the gap in his front teeth. That's how in a bad state he was. Hypothermia, I mean, I'm not overly familiar with it, but does it cause your hair to go white? What what causes your hair to go white? <laughs> with, with hypothermia as well, and something that has been stated is that <clears throat> you do have the confusion of thinking that you're burning up. Let's take all your clothes off. Yeah, that's why a lot of people uh, are found in a state of undress. 
Yeah. Their clothes are found near them. And it's it's fair to say that other people were wearing their clothes. Yeah. Surely they'd be more clothes because I don't think they were wearing three jumpers. I think what I read, one of them was wearing a long sleeve pyjama top and then a sweater on top of that. But that's the most clothes that they were kind of wearing. It was just socks and, and yeah. two pairs of pants he was wearing. So you, you'd find the clothes around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it was hypothermia that got to these people, especially when they, th- they thought they had time to make a fire. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there was the theory that they had carbon monoxide poisoning through a faulty cooking stove and that that had caused hallucinations and caused them to be gripped with, like, just panic and just abandon everything. But um, it was found that their cooking stove was still neatly packed away. They hadn't even used it. So that definitely wasn't. Uh, couldn't have been anything. Uh, they also, because they were a, a kilometre away from the tree line, if they'd been an avalanche, they could never have outrun it. To get to the tree line, to get to a, a kilometre away to safety, there's no way they could have outran an avalanche. So we can rule out avalanche. Mm. I think from, from where they were as well, even if there was an avalanche, it would have to go in such a specific way to even get near them. Yeah. And even if it would go in that way... It would just run up against the tent. It wouldn't be like an all-encompassing avalanche. Yeah. Well, I, um, my friend who skis, I, I said to him, like, look where they kind of pitched their tent. What, what do you, what do you think? It's kind of in the open. Why, why would they, why would they do that? And he said, it's, you know, it's not that bad an incline. It's, it's, it's a safe place. I would have no problem pitching a tent there at all and when i've looked into it the incline actually wasn't um steep enough to even warrant them being in any kind of problems even if there had been a a snow slide because it was such a slight incline so i think we can rule out snow related shit yeah i mean that that's that for me as well that's why the the catabatic winds yes kind of don't make sense either i mean i do know it happened and it happened in sweden kind of the same thing i think yeah. nine people died yeah uh, and there was one survivor mm-hmm. but having having looked at them and now i i'm never going to profess to be an expert at this but they seem to be very very specialist winds. So basically, they they come from when... Oh, here we go. Science time. <laughs> they come from when uh, the air is getting cooler on a plateau. And basically, they just run all the way down the mountainside. But they're very... They're like corridors of wind. They're not... They're not like all. Oh, it's not like a hurricane or a snowstorm. You know, like when you see see the the films of people climbing the Everest and K two and whatnot, and there's just snow going everywhere. They seem to be very specific in, in corridors, and they can be very dangerous. Yeah, they are quite rare events, and they can get up to eighty knots, I think, or eighty miles an hour. Yeah, but. It's kind of the same theory for the avalanche for me with this. I I, assume, I suppose if the wind's coming down in a very, from that area and they think and, and the tent's flapping and then maybe they think it's an avalanche or a precursor to an avalanche, they could have just all got up and gone, right, we've got to go. Then they could have got disoriented. They, the wind could have actually disorientated them because it's that powerful and pushed them off track. Yeah. Then they could have got lost in the dark. And there is kind of a theory that says, like, there was two groups. They got split up. Yeah. So the two groups and then the second one that was found in the ravine, they wandered and fell into the ravine and that that's why they were there. And then the, the second group, they thought it, it may have calmed down. The wind may have calmed down and they tried to get back to the tent, but they couldn't. They were disorientated. But for me, the footprints, there's no one in a panic in this situation. So it's not yeah 
any kind of thing that they're going to go, all right, they're experienced, but are they experienced enough to outrun an avalanche, outrun the the chaotic wind? Well, I mean, there's infrasound theory, isn't there? Where the the theory is that the, the winds around the mountain create this... Um, inaudible sound to the only kind of is picked up by your brain and it makes you have kind of like it makes your heart race it makes you feel a bit uneasy and then it progresses and progresses until you just have like outright panic which kind of did i did kind of think like i am kind of makes a lot of sense they were confused they were disoriented and all this but then like you say they didn't leave the tent in a panic they just went, hey, let's go for a walk without our shoes on or yeah. most of our clothes and leave everything here. It just That's not the kind of thing you do. If there's no signs of them having any kind of fright or panic or anything, that rules out avalanche, it rules out catabaric winds, it rules out infrasound. I mean, there's the, even the fucking Yeti theory, that's ruled out, isn't it? Because I swear to God, if you saw the abominable snowman coming down that friggin' mountain, you'd be out there like a light whoosh you wouldn't see me for dust <laughs> you'd be high tailing it you i mean <clears throat> like let's 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 go down the yeti route there was there was the only footprints around the camp were human footprints yeah and they weren't size 19 <laughs> or whatever they no. were normal size they were these people's footprints uh there's no sign of animals no. bears or anything like that in the area there's no signs of anybody else being in the area there was that photo they found on their reel of film wasn't there that people were like oh my god they photographed a yeti and they were writing because they as like a kind of joke thing they would write this pretend evening chronicle newspaper style thing what they were doing between okay. themselves and they were they kept talking about snowmen and so people you know the tinfoil hat people were like oh, they were being hunted by the yeti and they've got this picture and they were talking about snowmen so the snowmen they were talking about i think was tongue in cheek they were just having a laugh and the picture of the yeti uh, it was just one of them uh, just poking like peeking around uh, a tree uh, it was just uh, it was just blurry uh, but it was clearly it was just a hiker it was just one of them they weren't pretending to be a yeti they just i think People just jump to conclusions. Oh um, yeah, yeah, of course it's. <laughs> so you can rule out that theory as well. Of uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even. No, as well as the aliens one, we'll. we'll yeah, these 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 did have to be. Did have to be other signs. Yeah. Around it, and it was it was just these people. The thing is, the no urgency. Mm -hmm. of these people now there's also there's also a theory that the Mansi people who are uh, indigenous people to Russia and there's, they were they live in this area and it was said or a theory is that there was shamans out getting high on magic mushrooms and they got upset that these people had strayed onto the Mansi lands but this theory falls down because a the Mansi were peace loving people. Yeah. There's there's no recorded incidents of them attacking anyone. And B, if Russia, it's the USSR, if one of them would have done anything, all of them would have gone into the gulag. It Yeah. It's they weren't a part of mainstream society. They were very not very lucky, but in the eyes of the party at the time, they were very lucky to exist. If they start messing around with quote marks real people, then they're, they're all going to go to the gulag. And there's, there's no way that they wouldn't have found a reason. Like, I don't think they, that, that area of the mountain didn't actually, it wasn't like uh, sacred to them or anything. They had no reason to even go out that far. There was nothing to hunt there either. So I think, yeah. We can rule out the mansions. Yeah, that, I, that's 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 just. Uh, yeah, I mean, it does leave us with the only, well, two, but there's only like one logical conclusion that something happened and it has been covered up. Clearly, there's a few little red flags that come up for me that the higher ups in the Communist Party like started to get involved in this once it started breaking. Yeah. The uh, Severed Lovsky 
head prosecutor was present at the first postmortems. He never had to be present in any of these postmortems, but he was there and he was there for three days. Hmm. The gentleman, Lev Ianoff, who led the inquest in 1959. Yeah. He actually said in his report that he saw flying flying spheres at the time that this was happening, that this all went on. But his superior from Moscow said, no, you didn't see that. That didn't happen. And he was told to retract his statement. There was also the radiation that was on the victims and the the helicopter pilot yeah. saying, no, we, we, we need to put them in sink, lime coffins kind of thing. And there is actually evidence that the military were testing parachute mines in the area at this time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people actually did. um, A lot of people that were living in and around the area even claimed that they saw these orange spheres in the sky that they just assumed was like missile tests or nuclear weapons tests, but nobody mentioned anything because it was Cold War era and, you know, nobody wanted to end up in the gulag but um there, there was loads of people that said they saw those orange spheres that's it nobody nobody went against the party and no one of the uh the mansi tribal leaders actually said at the time they saw something i describe it as a missile but obviously they probably didn't know what it was but it was very conical shaped and it was mm-hmm. flashing through the sky and at first they thought it was a meteor the people that saw it thought it was a meteor, but whatever it was, they knew it was not a good sign. And yeah, it 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 wasn't really. I mean, I'll agree with you with the the predation. Yeah, the eyes and the tongue, but the eyebrows. I want to know what happened to the eyebrows. <laughs> I feel like that that you need to start a blog or something. That's a missing link. I tell you, that is going to solve this case. <laughs> what animal eats eyebrows? Um, going to do experiments. I mean, yeah, well. you're going to have to. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I can't think of any animals that eat eyebrows. I mean, the the government classified the files. Uh, the families wanted to have their the funerals in their own hometowns and the government was like no no we'll just bury them where they are uh no no we'll take the bodies of our children thanks and we'll bury them in a proper funeral uh we won't just dump them under the snow where they fell like you want them to be and uh, then they classified all the files they wouldn't give them any answers and then when they finally did agree to let them hold the funerals in their own hometowns uh igor and zina their funeral um the the mourners that showed up there was thousands of them the the procession went it, it went on for yonks um but by the time it came to the other bodies the gov- the government had turned around and said families only it's we don't want it it's not a big public affair we're going to hush hush everything why if it's a national tragedy you would think that the government it would make them look better to go, yes, no, we want to make a big deal out of this this horrible thing that happened to these kids. We, we are going to make a big deal out of it rather than going, no, 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 we don't want anybody to know about this. We'll just keep it all just on the down low here. Why? I, I don't know. And as well, because these were these were the best and the brightest as well of the, the people that they had. I mean, the Alexander Kolotov, he was a uh, nuclear physicist. He'd actually worked in Moscow yeah. at a secret installation, apparently. But I think Ludmilla was part of the young communists. They were all very, I mean, obviously, during that time, you had to be very party line or else you were you were out kind of thing. But they were all very mm-hmm. USSR communist. This is the way it is. Even, even Nik- yeah. Nikolai, who's dad was a Frenchman and had been persecuted by the communists. He was very, very party line with with yeah. this. So why are you not, not celebrating them, but at least bringing them into the mainstream and saying mm-hmm. these are these these people should be 
maybe not martyrs, but do you know during that time they were heroes? There was you, you, all you need to do was shoot an Nazi and you'd yeah. be a hero. Well, yeah. But and the fact as well that compounds it mm-hmm. is that they've actually said no. The actual cause of death is by avalanche. That just make, pulls up more questions because that's this yeah. year. They've said that this year, sixty years after it's happened. Well, seventy years after it's yeah. happened, they've actually turned around and said it was caused by this, even though there's no evidence of anything happening around there like this. Yeah, it's an avalanche. Oh, okay. So if it was an avalanche, why did you classify the files for decades? Exactly. If it was just an avalanche, <laughs> it's 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 a weird one. Do you know what it is as well, right? So this this guy, uh, the the book that I read, Donny Icar, he's an American um, author, journalist, um, and film producer, and he uh, he went to Russia to retrace their steps, and he had the head of the Dyatlov Foundation helping him. Yeah. And when he got to Russia, he kept all these files that he'd, all the research that he'd been doing um, on his laptop and uh, the head of the foundation had sent this cab driver to come and pick him up, this, this car to pick, come and pick him up and drive him to this guy's house. And as soon as the car dropped him off, it was um, involved in a collision that the guy from the foundation was convinced was deliberate to try and stop Donny Icar looking into any of any more info. And this was 2012. So this wasn't in the 50s. It wasn't in the 60s. This was recent. And it was like the government was still trying to stop people from digging too much into it. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Which is a bit suspicious for me, especially if they're turning around and saying, well, it's just an avalanche. Look into it all you like. Yeah. So what do you think? For me, they were just too experienced. These people were just too experienced to have an accident. Do you know? Do you know? Uh, not been paying attention, and the way they were found—no clothes, no shoes. Yeah, it re- it really do- it smacks of something that has happened. They've come across something. It smacks of KGB. And they shouldn't be where they are, and to keep everything quiet, they've they've had to be disappeared. Yeah. That's what I think, especially since the the guys that were part of the first search party, they were absolutely 100% convinced they had already searched the area where the next set of bodies were found. They were 100% convinced they had already searched that area from top to bottom and there was no bodies. And then shortly after that, these bodies suddenly appeared, like they'd been put there, like it was staged. Now that's interesting. Now that's interesting because the second set of bodies were the bodies that had the soft tissue damage yeah. done. And I read something that I dismissed out of hand before you said that, that they were actually chemical burns or radioactive burns, like the no eyes and the no eyebrows. And the, the, there was damage on the, the lips of these people. And these uh, these were the people that mm-hmm. skin was reddish brown. Yeah. It's, it was saying that these four in particular had been taken back and dumped in this place. This wasn't the original... They, this wasn't their original death scene. And especially because of their chest... Injuries. It was said that the coroner, I think the, the post-mortem was, you'd get these from a car crash. Car crash, yeah. Mm-hmm. But if they were found down a ravine, then fine. If you're falling off the ravine and you land on your chest, then yeah, fine, fair enough. But they all had little skin tissues. Like the Alexander had, uh, a, his, his neck was twisted in a very odd way. It just it wasn't a natural way to be twisted, and he had a little wound behind his ear. Mm. I mean, it does. It, it, bear in mind they were buried under lots of feet of snow. You would think that, given mm. the state of the other bodies, which were relatively um, well preserved, that they would also, being buried under so many feet of snow, would also be well preserved. But the state of decomposition. I mean. At the funeral, um, Dubonina, Dubonina's dad had requested an open casket and the funeral director had flat out said, no, you don't 
you don't want to see this. It's not how you want to remember your daughter. It's it's really I advise against it. And her dad demanded an open casket. The funeral director opened the casket and her dad promptly passed out. That was the level of decomposition. Uh, she was barely, rec- well, she was unrecognizable anymore. So that would kind to me, given that they're saying that the bodies were well preserved because of the snow, uh, she should have been well preserved. The only way that she wouldn't have been pre- well preserved is if she'd been moved somewhere else and left to decompose somewhere that maybe wasn't it out in the snow or under the snow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and as well, if they're like they're, if they're under four meters of snow, they're frozen. So you know when yeah. you have something at the back of your freezer, that ice cream that you bought in two thousand and ten, you still got it at the back of the freezer. <laughs> yes. and it gets them uh, that ice stuff on it. Surely that is how how is it going to have predation from that? Because as soon as all right, if the snow melts, yeah, it it would melt. But then the decomposition would start straight away. So it would be mm-hmm. it yeah. would be horrible. But just for that, like literally so horrible that no animal would want to eat it. But there wasn't any animals there really, was there, in the area? No, that that's the thing as well. There was the, This is the, why they chose the route, because there was no bears or wolves or anything that would endanger them they were too high up yeah yeah so even if they were left out in the snow and then say they didn't fall into the ravine say that they were left out in the snow and they maybe maybe afterwards there was a, a lance a snow slide and the snow buried them so they were even left out to the open to the elements for a little bit surely the the temperature alone would have been enough to to still preserve them. Yeah, like the others. It would have preserved them, yeah. But she was in such a... I mean, the, the, it was advanced decomposition. And I... Yeah, now I think about it, actually, that's... That mm. doesn't really fit. No, it doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. And I wouldn't have thought about that until you you, you, met and you said that, that because they, they may have been moved. Yeah. Well, Yuri Yudin himself is convinced that his theory is that they were they came across something that they shouldn't have seen, some kind of experimental weapons testing, and they were marched out of their tent by the KGB at gunpoint, uh, who then made them stage it to look like it had been an avalanche and they'd all run their separate ways, and then the KGB killed them. Or just told them to stay out there and don't come back until they died of hypothermia. And that's Yuri Yudin's theory. I mean, he wasn't there, so we'll never know, but I think it does stink of KGB. I think it does. I think it's got Putin written all over this. <laughs> no, this is the second one we've done about, oh, we're going to oh, lock in my door. Oh, I mean, Jesus. do you know what, right? I remember um, me and Dave were driving back from the cinema. It was really, really late one night. It was about ten years ago, and um, and he he looked up in the sky and he was like, "Oh my god, do you see that?" And there was this like glowing light in the sky, and he he looked at me and I looked at him, and he had this wide eyed look and he was like, "Oh my god, I think that's a UFO." And at exactly the same time as he said, "Oh my god, I think it's a UFO," I was like, "It's definitely Russians." <laughs> it's, it's always Russians. It is. It is. Cat can vouch for that. It's, it's always. But we yeah. love you, Russia. Please don't hack us. <laughs> well, they're going to be so bored if they hack me because all they'll get out of my phone is about four million pictures of bugs in various states of sleep. I'm not even going to say what they get from me, but. <laughs> Pornhub library? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> Fine, man, I need SD card. But uh, anyway. Uh, SD card, how old are you? It's called cloud storage. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, no, definitely. I didn't, I didn't want to believe that it was Russia or paranormal or anything like that. You know, I didn't, I, I thought it was kind of easier to explain. Like with the 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 uh, catabatic winds, with yeah. the avalanche, with maybe 
something happening, be, be a natural occurrence happening and scaring them. But it's... They weren't in a rush. Yeah. This is the one thing that I just can't get my head past. I just cannot. There's too many inconsistencies as well. Yeah. There's the way that only half the group was pred- predation and the other half wasn't, even though the ones that had predation were under four metres of snow and were like ice block. And why did they split up? They travelled that many miles together anyway why why split up surely they would have known if they were in a avalanche or something the best things we did to do would be to stick together not split up or from the footprints or from the way that they didn't seem like they were in a life and death situation so there's no reason to no to to run off or or to not at least be in voice contact with each other yeah (sighs) it's uh It's a strange one. We may never know. But it was the Russians. It's always the Russians. Yeah, we may never know. Love you, Putin. (laughs) I was going to say, we may never wake up tomorrow either. (laughs) I know, I know, yeah. (laughs) And you know, the guy that I do the research with, Nick, he's he's so convinced there's an avalanche. He he legit like ruined my evening the other the other week when we were doing the research because I was like like telling him all these theories and he was like, yeah, it's an avalanche. I was like, and then, and then he gave me all this like evidence that pointed towards, yeah, it's probably an avalanche. And I was like, you just like you just ruined this mystery for me because that's a really boring theory that it's an avalanche. And then I read this book and I'm like, it was definitely not an avalanche. <laughs> so it's fine. Like it was the mystery was salvaged for me. The thing it can't catabatic wins I'll kind of buy for a discount, not full price. But an <laughs> avalanche, I'm not having anything to do with. It. I'm sorry, no. Same. Literally, they it's it's too the way the tent was buried. It was only kind of half buried. Yeah. So there wasn't any danger. Okay, maybe an avalanche. Okay, it happens in two stages and whatnot, but. The hundred expeditions have been done since then, and there's not even been conditions for an avalanche. Yeah, exactly. Never mind that someone's seen one and gone, "Oh bloody hell, avalanche!" <laughs> there's not even been conditions of loose snow of, and the trajectory of the mountain wasn't. It would have to go in such a way, like the catabatic winds is. Could be because it could have fooled them into thinking there was an avalanche coming or a precursor to an avalanche. Yeah, but they apparently like fizzle out after like no more than three minutes. So after three minutes, they would have gone, oh, mountain faked us out. Let's go back to the tent. It's all right. False alarm, everyone. That's it as well. By the time they would have even not even been near the tree line, the winds would have died down. They would have gone, yeah. All right, okay. I'll go back now because I've got no fucking shoes on. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And, I mean, how long does an avalanche usually last? Because apparently um, they would have survived six hours tops. That's a long-ass time. Six hours is a really fucking long time. Does an avalanche last for six hours? No, but they probably last a couple of minutes. But then if they're under the snow... Well, yeah, but I mean, by the time they kind of got to the tree line and went, oh, it's not an avalanche, they still could have survived for six hours in, enough to go w- to walk back to their tent, which was only one kilometre away. Yeah. Oh, oh, with what they had and, and, and what they... Ah, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, no chance. They were... What what were they? They were. I think they were 300 metres away from it, weren't they? Yeah. So they easily would have had enough time survival wise to get back to the tent yeah they they weren't that inept and that much of a rube rubes not to know where they were at least one of them would have thought about where they were going especially because they weren't panicking yeah this is the thing if they were panicking you can go yeah they got lost in the dark but they were walking yeah it's annoying me now need to know we'll never know (laughs) The eyebrows, just figure the eyebrows out and it'll all I'm fall gonna, into place. Uh, Google search that in a bit. I'm going to I'm gonna have to go page six on Google <laughs> searches to find out what your eyebrows are. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> Why would your eyebrows be missing? <laughs> That's going to generate so many searches. You know this, right? <laughs> We'll keep the Russians happy anyway, busy, won't we? Uh, keep them busy. Uh. <laughs> They'd be like, oh, this guy's boring as shit. <laughs> Let's leave him. Look at all his search history. <laughs> he just wants to shave his eyebrows off, this, this weirdo. <laughs> False alarm. Go and tell Putin. What is eyebrowwigs.com? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> oh. It's like a merkin, but not... <laughs> One guy's obsessed with people with no eyebrows. This other bitch is obsessed with cats. Let's fucking let's leave the pair of them. They're not spy material. <laughs> no, no, they're not going to do us any, any damage, are no. they? Jeez. <laughs> we'll be fine. Yeah, we'll be fine. Uh, <laughs> and that's the last podcast ever from us two because we'll be dead. Uh, <laughs> no, so that was yeah, the yeah, Diatlov Pass. There, uh, <laughs> yes. It, it just too many questions on this one. It, even the recent investigations have just sparked too many more questions into it. I suppose unless you were there, that's the only way you're ever going to know this has happened because obviously it's 70 years ago now and there are very, very few people who were alive at that time in the area and... There, there's very little evidence of anything actually happening. A lot of substantial evidence, but nothing hard there, unfortunately. So, very interesting case. And the pictures of it, they do, they do, they have left diaries and pictures, yep. which have survived until today. So, if you want to have a Google search of them, because uh, they are, they are, mm-hmm. they are really interesting, especially the Yeti one, which uh, is really scary. <laughs> Yeah, terrifying. <laughs> it's not even he's not even hit behind a tree. I know. <laughs> he's just literally in the skis where they have just been. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, wait for me, please. Uh, I was having a piss. Don't leave. <laughs> just turn around and you've gone. <laughs> but no, there's some nice photos there. There's a lot of camaraderie. Yeah. It's kind of poignant. It is, and, and and this is the thing about them. They were a a really cro- close knit group of friends, and I think some of the pictures it does really come through on that, and some of the the, the diaries and the statements that I've read are uh, they were a group that were together, and that makes it even more frustrating that they wouldn't just all panic and up and leave each other. I think they they'd be there till the end for each other and unfortunately they were yeah. to, to the very end it's just unfortunate that a uh yeah. eight young people and one old giffer died <laughs> well giffer. i know i know i know what he was trying to do he's trying to relive his youth weren't he hanging around with young people don't work i know i've tried it i was gonna say is that what you're gonna do you're gonna decide you want to go on a hike up a snow mountain <laughs> don't do it aunt Anyway, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> that has been the MO podcast with me, Consumatious Anne, and my lovely co host, Latreya. We shall see you next time and take care. Bye. Bye.